I think we can honestly say that the entire body of Christ, the church, is indeed in crisis. Leading up to the place in which the church finds itself now were two things coming together. One was the allegations against Archbishop McCarrick and his conduct with seminarians within his ministry as a priest and then a bishop. And the second was the grand jury report from Pennsylvania that not only was re-examining the way in which the sexual abuse crisis of the early 2000s was handled, but then finding that in some cases maybe not everything that should have been made known at the time had been made known and so has given rise to this sense of questioning whether or not some of our leaders have been completely forthcoming in the extent of the sexual misconduct of priests and of ministers within the church and how some of those cases were handled. Yeah, this is bigger than 2002. I think that people are frustrated and so am I that I would say, well, didn't we fix this in 2002? I thought we addressed this. And now it seems to be going through it all over again, and it seems to be spreading all over the country, These all these investigations state by state. So it's gonna drag out for several years and be very painful. People are reeling, people are hurt. People want to find a way forward. And by people, I mean the priests, the bishops, the lay people, people. Now we're all broken. There is definitely something fundamentally wrong with the way the church is being governed today, at least as it's been experienced through these sexual scandals. Uh, I think there's a real loss of faith uh, among many Catholics um, at different levels, priests, probably bishops themselves, certainly lay people who feel as though the church is not the place to go to to get some of these issues resolved. And if that's the case, right, if, if people have really lost trust in the church herself as the vehicle for the pursuit of knowledge and justice about these circumstances, then that is a kind of crisis. The church has been critically wounded, and I don't know if it's going to ever heal in my lifetime, I don't think so, but uh, maybe what the scripture says, everything we brought into the light, and that what is really needs to happen. We can't do it ourselves, and if it means that reporters in newspapers have to go digging to bring out the light, or grand juries from different states need to do that, I have no problem with that. I do believe there's been a break in the trust. This is a dangerous moment, a very dangerous moment for us all because trust is another word for faith. Um, and that's, that's been true to the theological tradition often to speak of faith in terms of trust. And to say that trust is broken means faith is broken. Lay people have a great yearning to see concrete examples of transparency. First and foremost, they want to hear that the bishops are sorry for their failures. I think they would like to see some genuine expressions of sorrow, of acceptance for what they failed to do. I think they would like to hear some of our leaders say they put their own needs or their own reputation and the reputation of the institution of the church ahead of the needs of people who have been gravely harmed, of victims whose lives have been shattered. By enabling abuse victims to expose those who commit and conceal child sex crimes in court. Victims deserve to have their day in court. The summer of 2018 began with allegations involving then Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, accused of sexually abusing a minor almost 50 years ago, and having sexual conduct with seminarians while he was a bishop in New Jersey, accusations he has denied. The retired Archbishop of Washington offered his resignation to the College of Cardinals, which was accepted by Pope Francis, bumping him down from a cardinal to an archbishop. 
These McCarrick accusations were decades old, and Catholics throughout the U.S. began to wonder who among church leaders knew what and when, given that rumors began circulating that Archbishop McCarrick had a sketchy reputation among seminarians. In fact, one priest has said he complained to church officials about Archbishop McCarrick's conduct with seminarians many years ago. U.S. Catholics also wondered why Archbishop McCarrick was repeatedly elevated by the church if these suspicions about him really had been common knowledge. Before the summer was over, another bombshell rocked the church with the August release of a Pennsylvania grand jury report covering 70 years of abuse allegations in six of that state's Catholic dioceses, starting in 1947. Finally, to announce the results of a two-year grand jury investigation into widespread sexual abuse of children within the Catholic Church and the systematic cover-up by senior church officials in Pennsylvania and at the Vatican. The grand jury uncovered credible evidence of sexual abuse against 301 predator priests. Over 1,000 child victims were identified by our investigation, though the grand jury notes that they believe that number was in the thousands. It was child sexual abuse, including rape, committed by grown men, priests, against children. In the Diocese of Erie, the grand jury named 41 priests who sexually abused children. One priest in Erie, Father Chester Goronsky, fondled boys and told them he was doing so to perform a cancer check. One priest, Father Raymond Lukak, impregnated a 17-year-old girl, forged another pastor's signature on a marriage certificate then divorced the girl shortly after she gave birth. Over a 10-year period, the priest, Gus Giella, sexually abused five sisters from the same family. Giella began sexually abusing one of the sisters, Carolyn, when she was just 18 months old. Father Robert Mosliner groomed his middle school students for oral sex by telling them how Mary had to lick Jesus clean after he was born. Monsignor Thomas Benestad made a nine-year-old give him oral sex, then rinsed the boy's mouth out with holy water to purify him. Victims were shamed. They were ridiculed. When these children told authority figures of their abuse, their accounts were questioned, and they were hushed and shunned. For many of the victims, this grand jury report is justice. The grand jurors felt a responsibility to expose the abuse and make recommendations to ensure that something like this never happens again. The Holy Father understands how much these crimes can shake the faith and the spirit of believers. Survivors and victims should know that the Pope is on their side he wants the church to listen to them so that we can root out this tragic horror which has destroyed the lives of so many innocent people. I think, I think what the church is doing is, is with the priests and the bishops and everything, especially in America, totally bad. They need to do something to stop it. I don't know what that is, but they need to do something. No one's stopping it. So they need to stop it. Ma la Chiesa è, è santa e peccatrice, quindi dove va? Dove va? Va sempre verso l'umano, va sempre verso l'uomo, va sempre verso i poveri, quindi cerca di fare il possibile. Certo siamo tutte persone umane e possiamo sbagliare, ma non è che noi ammettiamo queste cose assolutamente. There are really just two words which can express our feelings right now about these horrible crimes, and those are shame and sorrow. The Holy See clearly takes very seriously the work of the grand jury and the very lengthy report um, it produced. The church clearly condemns the sexual abuse of minors. In the remaining weeks of August, victims and victims groups began to speak out publicly and 
demand changes from the church. My name is Jim Van Sickle. I'm a victim of clergy sexual abuse. I was 16 years old and going into my junior year at Bradford Central Christian. And the priest who molested me became my English teacher and he and I became pretty quickly friends. He asked me to be a part of a chess team that he was starting and asked me to be the captain of that team. We used to play a lot of chess in study hall. Um, we quickly began a, a closer friendship by just traveling with that team, going to dinner as a team after. Uh, I can't really say when it changed, but eventually it was just him and I going to dinner. Uh, we'd get together, uh, he'd come to the house, he'd pick me up in his car. Uh, I remember early on him putting his hand on my leg or touching me on the shoulder. Uh, it was uncomfortable. It was probably the loudest the bells were ever in our relationship as far as any kind of an alarm in my, in my feelings of what was going on. Jim Van Sickle of Pittsburgh was one of more than a thousand victims identified in a recent Pennsylvania grand jury report, a scandal that rocked the Catholic Church and brought the topic of clerical sex abuse back into focus. Jim says he buried the abuse for decades, but when the priest was arrested earlier this year on another charge, he decided to come forward, a decision he now says has helped him heal. He has since begun to reach out to other abuse survivors and is now becoming an advocate for laws that will extend the statute of limitations for civil and criminal cases. The current laws prevent Jim from filing charges or bringing a lawsuit because his case occurred nearly four decades ago. What we're asking for, we want the church to become transparent as they say they're becoming transparent, but we want them to support the SOL change here in Pennsylvania with a retro window and pull back the lobbying arm of the church as well as somehow control the lobbying arm of the insurance companies so that these legislators can put on their legislative hats rather than their Catholic hats when they go in to make a decision on whether or not they're going to protect the church over a thousand victims that just came forth in a grand jury report. Though Bishop Lawrence Persico of Erie, Pennsylvania says he is still discerning whether he'll support a change in the statute of limitations laws. He did meet with Jim on August 21st, following a news conference in front of his chancery by the Survivors Network of Those Abused by Priests, better known as SNAP. I can understand the anger he must feel and also the pain because here was someone as a high school student who trusted in a priest, and that priest broke his trust and damaged him. It's going to take a while for healing to take place. We need to gain their trust. We need to show by our actions that we mean that we are sorry, and we will do better in what we've been doing, and work harder at protecting children. The trust that we had in the past, no. It may be a guarded trust in the future, but I don't think it will go back to the way it was. I mean, it, it's broken. And I don't know how you repair that. Going forward, I think it will be a different type of trust. But it's not going to happen overnight. I do not hate Catholicism. My speaking out is nothing to do with the religion. It has nothing to do with the faithful at all. I, I want them to stay in the church. I don't want this grand jury to report to have people walk away from the church. The church is the people. It's not the walls. It's not the buildings. It's not the statues. And it's not the people dressed up in robes. They're people. They're human. They make mistakes. In his journey of healing, Jim traveled to his boyhood parish in Bradford, Pennsylvania, and spoke with the current pastor of the church. Both of us have to listen with open ears and forgiving hearts. Because we put the walls up so long to protect the image of the church. But Pope Francis said it so beautifully, 
We're, we're in a field hospital, and that's the truth. I want the church to literally say, this has happened. We did this wrong. Lay that at the feet of Christ and accept accountability. There are these brave men and women who have come forward now, but I think there are many others on the sidelines just waiting, trying to get the courage to come forward or waiting until they're ready. Some U.S. bishops began to voice their own frustration with the growing crisis. Bishop Lawrence Persico of Erie, Pennsylvania, welcomed members of the Survivors Network of Those Abused by Priests, better known as SNAP, onto the grounds of his chancery August 21st and told them he wanted to hear their stories. Bishop Persico believes clericalism has contributed to the perpetuation of sexual predator priests. I think clericalism is a problem because it isolates the person. Some get on a career track and they're not too concerned about the damage behind them. Others behave like it's the old boys club, clerics only, you know. Don't deal with the laity, don't talk to the laity, we're better than they are. And I think that has bred a lot of this. Well, I don't have the magic potion, but I think to realize in the beginning that we are all members of the body of Christ, but given different roles in the church, where these are not ex exclusive in the sense that if I become a priest, I'm better than a lay person, or if I'm married, I'm better than a single person. We're in this together in order to serve the needs of the church and carry out Christ's mission. As summer moved into fall, the controversy only grew. Bishops named in the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report encountered criticism about how they handled past clergy sex abuse allegations. Vilified for how he handled cases when he was Bishop of Pittsburgh, Cardinal Donald Whirl of Washington offered Pope Francis his resignation as the Archbishop of Washington in light of the scandal, and the Pope accepted it. It was clear the 2018 clerical sexual abuse scandal was going to dominate the U.S. Bishop's annual Fall General Assembly in Baltimore, and Catholics were eager to hear how they were going to deal with the crisis. The Baltimore meeting of the U.S. Catholic Conference of Bishops is going to be a pivotal point, I think. I like to see the, the bishops when they meet, they have to do something they've been hesitant to do, to make themselves accountable and to acknowledge their mistakes. And the abuse issue has involved two things, abusive priests and bishops not knowing how to handle that. It's done a lot of harm, a lot of discouragement, a huge amount of anger and skepticism about who we are and what we stand for. And I think they have to do a lot of work before they can restore their credibility as a religious force in the United States. I was disappointed, frankly, in the public misconceptions about the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report. What it gave us, frankly, was a long list of dead and defrocked priests. At least 44% of every priest on that list were, were, had been deceased. And the rest of them were out of ministry if they had a substantiated allegation. If there was an allegation that was substantiated, they were not in ministry. There was a handful that had unsubstantiated allegations, which subsequently may or may not be true. But the, the church is being uh, faithful to the Dallas Charter. One strike and you're out. Zero tolerance and you're out. The Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report showed us in reality that the Dallas Charter is working. We changed our approach in 2002 and it's working. Look at the CARA statistics from Georgetown. The number of allegations has plummeted uh, in the last two decades. The Dallas Charter really is the most effective and extensive child protection program in the world. It includes mandatory reporting of cases, zero tolerance, one strike and you're out permanently, a mandatory child safe education for anyone who works with minors, uh, background checks, again, for anyone who works with minors, victims assistance coordinators, uh, shepherding victims through the process of reporting, 
also includes diocesan review boards, uh, plus we have uh, annual audits of dioceses to make sure they're doing it right. So it's a very comprehensive program. We want to stop abuse before it occurs. Sure, we want to deal with allegations well, but does prevention work? And the answer is yes. Six million Americans have been trained by the Catholic Church in child protection. Four million children, two million adults. If you work with a child in the Catholic Church in this country, you will go through that safe environment training and it works. Abuse rates are, are plummeting. So I think any of these kinds of charters can be improved upon, particularly with the passage of time and what, with what we've learned really works and what are some areas that need to be strengthened. Well, I think the big lacuna, if you will, and it was not in the Dallas Charter, was the accountability of bishops. And it wasn't in the Dallas Charter because the bishops have no authority to discipline each other. And so that's really the big issue today. How are bishops held accountable? And that's, they'll begin to discuss that issue then. And that's what I think lay Catholics in the United States are looking for, is first, the church to acknowledge the problem, the extent of the problem, and the complicity of um, individuals that were involved in this, and perhaps even the way in which certain cultural practices among the bishops may have allowed this stuff to exist and not be caught earlier. I think they want to see bishops in a listening mode. Listening to victims. We passed that Dallas Charter, the bishops passed the Dallas Charter in 2002. Right before they voted on it, four victims spoke to all 300 bishops and told their story. And when you hear the pain of victims, that's what changes people's hearts. So I would love to see, yes, prayer and retreat, wonderful. But let's also continue listening to the stories and the pain of our victims. That changes hearts, and I think it's, it's important. I also think people are hoping that the bishops spend more time in their dioceses being shepherds and not CEOs. When the U.S. bishops assembled in November, the meeting began with a startling announcement. Dear brothers, I need to open our time together with an important announcement. At the insistence of the Holy See, we will not be voting on the two action items in our documentation regarding the abuse crisis, that is, the standards of accountability for bishops and the special commission for receiving complaints against bishops. The Holy See has asked that we delay voting on these so that our deliberations can inform and be informed by the global meeting of the conference presidents that the Holy Father has called for February 2019. I'm sorry for the late notice, but in fact, this was conveyed to me late yesterday afternoon. Although I am disappointed that we will not be taking these actions tomorrow in terms of vote, I remain hopeful that this additional consultation will ultimately improve our response to the crisis we face. It is clear that the Holy See is taking seriously the abuse crisis in the church, seeing it as a watershed moment, not just for the church in this country, but around the world, in putting so much emphasis on the February meeting. At the same time, as you are our representative going to that meeting, we need to be very clear with you where we stand, and we need to tell our people where we stand. And so I would suggest that we carry on our discussions on these documents, that we fine-tune them through our understanding, debate, and the ways that amendments can be proposed, and that instead of taking a binding vote as an action item, we take a resolution ballot so that we can communicate to you as you go to that meeting representing us where we stand and what we need to say in that discussion. I also would then suggest, given the urgency of this moment, that instead of waiting until June, we have a special section session in March to deal precisely with this issue. We need as a conference, as brother bishops, to take up this issue for the good of the church in this country without delay. We can benefit from the discussions that happened in February, in fact, may find some new insights that we had not thought of. But we need to act soon without delay. I realize that having a meeting in March will be a logistic headache for staff and for all of our calendars, but it is something that we cannot delay. There's an urgency here. And so I would ask 
you and the leadership of the conference to give consideration to that. And maybe as we meet tomorrow, to discuss this particular proposal and get a sense of the House if we can proceed this way. Thank you. Thanks, Cardinal Subic. I think that's something we could probably bring up tomorrow to the uh, brethren uh, as we do the agenda and, uh, and move on with the meeting tomorrow. The bishops soldiered on with their meeting and listened to survivors of clergy sex abuse. I'm a daughter of the Most High God. I'm also a survivor of child sexual abuse from when I was very young, over a number of years, by more than one priest. My story can't cover all of the suicides and the addictions. It can't cover all of the mental wounds, the acute mental illness, the chronic mental illness that people will courageously manage and never really often hear the comment of how that mental illness brings beauty to the world, which our Lord knows. All of the medical illnesses, the autoimmune diseases, born of the heightened cortisol that happens when you live constantly in fear, and the loneliness and the isolation and the fear, all of the rejection, we are the damaged goods of our, our age. I am a survivor of clergy sex abuse. Abuse of a child is the closest that you can get to murder and still possibly have a breathing body before you. When a child has been abused, particularly by someone whom they trust, you have destroyed the child. You have mortally wounded the spirit and the soul of that child. This is particularly true when the abuser is a priest. You have taken the most holy elements of that child, his connection to God, his innocence and his trust, his faith and his love, and used it as a conduit for evil. You have betrayed it and you have destroyed it. Truly, this is the devil's best work. Just outside of the building where the bishops' meeting was held were victims not invited to tell the bishops their stories, but who nonetheless made their voices heard. I think it's important to be here today because I think it's important for survivors who haven't come forward to see us, to know that, that we're here, we're here for them, that they can come out and find their voice too. And I think it's important for the bishops to see that we're here and that we're not going away and that we're going to keep demanding accountability, that we're going to keep demanding that they give us the truth. But we're angry and we're not going away. We want the truth. I know that two victims spoke to the bishops, and I don't know those victims. I think that the bishops need to talk to more victims. I think they need to talk to victims that choose to come forward. I don't know how they chose those victims, but I'm glad that they heard from them. I think that they really need to hear true stories to get an idea of the pain that a victim experiences from the time of their abuse all the way up till they die. I want them to come out of the sanctuary and sit in the pews with the rest of the people of God and have an honest conversation about what the problems are and, and how they can be resolved with a full voice of the, all of the people of God. I think there has to be more than lay involvement. I think if, if they just resort to adding some lay people as they did in 2002 and then ignore them then we're going to get nowhere again. I think there has to be a serious collaboration of the people of God, including bishops, clergy, and lay people, to come up with credible, honest solutions to something that has not yet been done. What we will be doing is honoring, in particular, the victims who have taken their own lives over the last 16 years plus because they are the ones with the deepest loss, they and their families. And with an NGO there headed The only thing that made me come forward is my abuser was outed by another person. And that happened in Kentucky and I was living here in Maryland. And I had not told anybody and I was 34 years old 
and trying to figure out how I break the silence and couldn't figure it out because I've been lying to everybody for the last 20 years. My mother called me and asked me, she said, Bierman has been accused of doing all these things. She said, did anything happen to you? And I did. So I would implore any parent to ask their child if anything happened to them, even if their child is 60 years old. Ask them, find out. Maybe they're looking for an opportunity, an opening to tell you what happened to them. The bishops believe that themselves to be sacredly ordained, to be better than the non-ordained. Taking advice from or subjugating themselves to the authority of the laity or survivors would be anathema to them. Though the bishops were not going to vote on reform measures during this particular meeting, they were eager to hear from experts, as well as proposals for reporting systems improvements. For many years, you, along with the clergy, religious, and laity of your dioceses, have toiled to extinguish the fires of the sexual abuse crisis. Those efforts have not been in vain. Nonetheless, your response to this crisis has been incomplete. Specifically, current events reveal a continued lack of transparency about past cases of abuse and the way they were handled, as well as a lack of accountability for bishops. The Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report exposed the fact that some bishops have not been sufficiently open and transparent. It has taken the intervention of the state and the media to fully expose the darkness of abuse in our dioceses. It is shameful that the sin of abuse was hidden and allowed to fester until uncovered by the secular world. The faithful and the clergy do not trust many of you. They are angry and frustrated, no longer satisfied with words and even with prayer. They seek action that signals a cultural change from the leadership of the church. Their distrust will remain until you truly embrace the principles of openness and transparency listed in the Charter. You must come to terms with the past. There cannot be reconciliation without full acknowledgement of the truth. While regrettably you will not be taking any action this week, the NRB still stands behind the recommendations I am presenting to you today to bring about transparency the National Review Board recommends that as soon as possible, you state your intentions to conduct a review of your diocesan and seminary files, especially archives and clergy personnel files dating back to at least 1950, if possible, and share the findings with the public. At minimum, the findings should include a list of clergy who have been credibly accused of sexual abuse of minors and vulnerable adults, and whether those cases were handled appropriately by bishops and their dioceses. To maintain credibility, the review process must involve the laity in some form, such as your diocesan review board or an external firm. Some of you have already conducted reviews and published lists of offenders and have expressed your intent to do so. Some of you have also invited your state's attorney general to conduct reviews. We strongly recommend that all other bishops follow suit. Beyond transparency, current events also reveal a lack of accountability for many bishops for their role in the abuse crisis. While much of the guilt has been placed on priests, bishops have often escaped punishment. Simply, the accountability of bishops has never been fully addressed. Full accountability of bishops requires at least two concrete actions, investigating allegations involving bishops and ensuring consequences for bishops who have failed in their responsibility to protect the vulnerable. Unlike the other elements we are proposing today, 
The third party reporting system has already been approved. The decision was made by the Administrative Committee in September. With this new system, we are trying to address a problem that some people have. The problem is this. Right now, they have no clear avenue to report allegations or complaints against bishops. Complaints against a bishop might include not only abuse of a minor, but also sexual harassment or other misconduct involving adults, or also the bishop's failure to respond adequately to abuse or misconduct complaints. We believe this new process will help our people to know where they can submit their complaints. This will increase transparency and ensure that their complaints are received and treated with the seriousness that they deserve from both church authorities and civil authorities. As we know, many for-profit and non-profit organizations have established hotlines like this. These systems provide for confidential reporting. When complaints are received, they are directed to a compliance officer or another official designated by the organization. It is important to keep in mind, these third-party systems have no role in investigating or evaluating complaints. They are designed to provide an effective way for people to make complaints and for the organization to gather information confidentially to be turned over to the appropriate investigators. Our system will receive three kinds of complaints. First, those involving allegations that a bishop has sexually abused a minor. Second, that a bishop has committed sexual harassment or other sexual misconduct against an adult. Third, and finally, we will receive complaints that the bishop has failed to respond adec adequately to claims of sexual abuse, harassment, or misconduct by others. There is a question of costs, and uh, it's not clear where that money is coming from, and as I've stated before, we're a poor rural archdiocese on the plains of Iowa, and um, there's going to be a lot of monetary uh, calls or sure. claims uh, on our resources with regard to other um, procedures and um, ways of going forward in this whole area. I think this proposal is very dangerous and unjust. It calls for reporting to the Apostolic Nunciature accusations not investigated, not substantiated, not proven. That's unjust. Are we going to take anonymous complaints? That has to be decided and thought about. As the bishops continued their debate, priests discussed the impact the revived scandal had on them personally. Personally, it's emotionally uh, devastating to a certain extent because I did not even understand myself the extent and the depth of the abuse, uh, which I don't really understand completely, um, but it was so many of my peers involved in it. It's absolutely uh, humiliating because of the issue of guilt by association. And I'm not sure if I walk publicly with my collar on, if I'm gonna be yelled at, cursed at, spit at or punched, I don't know. And I'm a little bit weary going out in public, wearing my collar, just going out to the post office right now, for example, and getting a series of dirty looks for what all my peers have done. As Cardinal Dulles said in 2002, the weight of this has been borne since then, and I think you know, still today, by priests. They're the front line, in essence. They're the guys who have to deal with angry parishioners who come to them and say, how, you know, how can I be receiving communion here, or why should I remain Catholic despite all this nonsense? They have to re they're the ones res you know, immediately responsive to those people, and on the other hand, they have to also be responsive to the bishops above them. So they're kind of caught in the middle, and I know some priests are very close to them. If you ask them, you'll hear this from them, uh, that there's a sense of real fatigue about this, real spiritual and physical fatigue as a consequence of this, and, and that's, that's a shame. Um, they should not have to bear this alone, for sure. The structure and organization in which we demand 
ethical practices and principles, and rightly so. And yet, in the background, when that's not being done, and innocent kids are taken advantage of, our spiritual and moral credibility is down the drain and not believable. When I think of my life in the priesthood for the past 27 years, and this summer of 2018 has been a tumultuous one, one where it has called me to question myself, my relationship to God, my relationship to bishops, my relationships to my fellow priests. It has called me to question even how people look at me when I walk down the street in a collar. I think about the people who've been abused, and I think about how we might be able to provide healing for them. I think about my own brokenness, the brokenness of so many, and how we might be able to experience God's healing love in a new way to bring about a holier church. I have priest friends of mine say, I'm not going to wear my collar because of the whole crisis. I say, nonsense. I'm going to wear my collar and, and I say, look, I, it's a tough situation. Uh, it's a, we're all a bit ashamed, frankly, uh, but we need to be out there. Uh, people need to see their priests. And frankly, I find a lot of support out there, even though people are upset, and I am too. Yeah, people say nasty things to you just because you're wearing your own collar. But for every nasty comment I get, I get, you know, 10 positive ones. When I give workshops to priests on this issue, I said, you know, we might not like our situation, but remember who really is suffering through this, and that's the victims. Remember, victims first. They're suffering with a lifetime of pain because of this. So let's not fall into our little pity parties. They're the real victims and their families. Uh, my abuser is from the Diocese of during the third day of the Bishop's Fall Assembly, some prelates made known their anger toward their brother bishop, Archbishop McCarrick. So much of the outrage that we experience, and I think it's a rightful outrage, it's not a blur of a rage, anger for its own sake, but outrage prompted by the injustice that our people have experienced at the hand of predators, outrage over the treatment of seminarians, our seminarians, our priests, who were entrusted to the care of former Cardinal McCarrick. A trust that was not only violated but was ignored by others who were responsible for paying attention. Archbishop McCarrick, it has to be said, has grievously offended the faithful Catholics of the United States, to say nothing of the multiple victims, most of all whom he has, he has offended. He's offended the priests that serve faithfully, but he has offended us as bishops, as bishops in a unique and important way. Uh, it seems in two ways, it seems to me. He has, he has uh, undermined, or if you want, attacked our Eucharistic unity and our apostolic integrity. The Holy See has removed him from the College of Cardinals and does have a process juridically based to address him. This body has yet to do so. We have said the Holy See should let us get some new norms. Let us put a process together. They need to let us do this. Do we use this process as a way to avoid our pastoral responsibilities? Or is it a means to an appropriate end? towards justice. He is an emeritus, and so as all emeriti are stated to be welcome guests here at this conference. He is not welcome. We should say that for his sake 
and out of respect for those whom he harmed. The well-justified wrath and suspicion of the faithful in the United States falls on us as their shepherds. They rightly expect us to do all that we can to rid the church in our country of the shameful residue of Theodore McCarrick's ministry. We love this church. This is our church. When someone asks, well, what's the laity's voice in all this? What I hear from the people of God, who I have been listening to over these last four or five months in a special way around this issue, the Archbishop McCarrick case has particularly upset them. Because in the case of Archbishop McCarrick, you have a situation in which a uh, priest became an auxiliary bishop in a major metropolitan diocese, a, a, a diocesan bishop, an archbishop, and then an archbishop and cardinal. What the people don't understand is this behavior must have been known because people are saying it was known. And how did, this, how did these promotions happen? Isn't that what people complained about in 2002? It wasn't so much the fact that there were individual people who did this terrible thing, but the fact that they were moved around, which created the lack of trust. And in this instance, it's that a man got promoted even though there was predatory behavior in his, in his background. Uh, which should have eliminated him from consideration. My genuine hope that we'll emerge from this meeting with a strong advisory vote on behalf of this whole body that reflects the gravity of the issue at hand, the urgency of the matter, the depth of the breach of trust that has been experienced among victim survivors and certainly in our communities. I think that there is in fact an urgency and I hope we do emerge with one voice, an advisory vote perhaps, that we will do everything in our power to remove a cancer and help heal this wound that is affecting so deeply the living body of Christ. I want to witness to the fact that what we have now is not working and it's not transparent, um, even in terms of what the process is, much less uh, how it works, and it, it takes too much time. Meaningful constraints on an accused bishop. I think that's the kind of thing that would be meaningful to the lay faithful if there were meaningful, recognized constraints uh, during the time of investigation, and then, of course, if he's been found guilty because we don't know why there's a correlation between an increased rate of homosexual clergy and an increased rate of sexual abuse of minors. So I would propose we commission a study to figure this out, and allow, or at least allow competent professionals in the field who want to conduct a study to have open access to all documentation and other such sources they need to help us understand this. There have been those who have said the Catholic Church is hung up on sex, and this may be further evidence of that. You know, we bishops are capable of malfeasance uh, in many other areas as well. Um, and so if this is the problem this week, uh, next week the people of God may be challenging us in other areas as well. Um, so I just wonder if th there's a certain blessing in the Holy See not allowing us to go forward with these provisions this week and that in the meetings that are taking place in February in Rome, there may be an opportunity really to adopt a, a much broader range of ways of holding bishops accountable and providing steps to deal with that. I'm wondering if we couldn't do something perhaps sooner rather than later to hold ourselves accountable, at least in the meantime. And could that be perhaps that we would follow up with allegations against a bishop, with the Metropolitan See, that that could be reviewed by the review board of that Metropolitan See, whether they be allegations of sexual abuse of minors or harassment or misconduct, and then have that review board of the Metropolitan See presented to the Holy See. There are ways in which we live as brothers that could be better. And I think that meaningful fraternal accountability is something we ought to take very seriously and that could be very helpful to us. Outrage, I guess, is important and it has its place, but today outrage has also become an industry. It's become an addiction 
as we see in our polarized politics, people are increasingly addicted to outrage. And it's become a, an industry in which loggers and cable TV are using outrage as a business plan to drive readers or listeners to their sites or to their stations and therefore raise their advertising revenue. Uh, so I think you know, we can't allow ourselves to be caught and to be played by people that would ex exploit other people's outrage and use us to, to keep feeding it. It's one thing to put lay people on various commissions because we feel we should or we have to. It's another thing to invite the laity and warmly welcome them to be collaborators with us in the best possible sense of the word so that we can learn from them and they can learn from us so that we can grow together to overcome this problem. It occurs to me though that we might also benefit from the wisdom of our priests, our brother priests. They are our closest collaborators, uh, theologically, spiritually, administratively, and um, I believe that by tapping them in a more formal way, those bodies of priests with whom we have a relationship already, NFPC, NOSERC, CMSM, ANCH, that this would be very helpful for us. Though the U.S. bishops passed no reforms involving clergy sex abuse during their November assembly, they will gather for a January retreat in Chicago to pray on the matter, and they will be represented when the world's bishops meet in Rome this February to address the issue. Some, however, believe real church reform may come from beyond the ranks of bishops, cardinals, or popes. I would say the church is in crisis because the church has failed to be faithful to one of its primary mandates, which is the protection of the dignity of the human person and the ability to create environments in which people can flourish. And so we have failed in caring rightly and justly for the victims and we have failed in making sure that what we said we had put in place was put in place in all cases. Thankfully, the church has found itself in crisis before and has always found a path forward to be able to be renewed and to be purified. And so as hard as it is to live in this moment, I think that hopefully we'll be stronger for it as we move through it. Sources of hope and renewal in the church always appear, um, and often in the least expected places. One of these places is among the least likely of people. Usually it's like some woman, right, in a religious community somewhere, or some man in a religious community somewhere, or a lay person, or a bold priest. So I don't know that we have to expect it in some place, but we know, generally speaking, there is renewal going on in the church right now. You see it among young people. You see it among these dynamic religious communities that have appeared over the past quarter of a century or so. These are places, I think, that are going to help carry us through this, where the church is going to undergo a kind of unexpected renewal of herself through the vehicle of loving, joyous, faithful, men and women, again, it's probably going to be young men and women um, who do this. I know some of these communities and they're extraordinary sources of power, even though that's, of course, the last thing that they're seeking. And that's a message, right? That's a lesson for a lot of us that if we go back to the issue of clericalism or we go back to you know the root causes of, of where we are right now, one of those, we, we taught this in scripture and the theological tradition, of course, is power. And it's in the pursuit of power for its own sake, often, that human beings find themselves getting into trouble. And when you find these men and women in religious community who, again, the last thing they're looking for is power. They're looking for discipleship. They're looking to follow. They're looking to serve. And as they do so, of course, their power just expands, you know, and, and their capacity to influence, to draw others in, 
become transformative devices against their own will almost just expands as well. And that's, I think, how the church is going to renew herself yet again in this time. That's always been the spring from which renewal has been nourished. People looking for authentic, deep discipleship and then becoming magnets, things around which the rest of us sort of congregate by virtue of their own holiness.